Welcome to Mike Check with Mike Shaw. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance. A show about news, politics, and other stuff. Watch me for the changes and try and keep up, okay? And now, here's your host. I make this look good. Mike, 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 Mike. Mike Shaw. Let's kick the tires and light the fires, Big Daddy. Ah, Friday Eve makes the weekend feel closer, seem closer, because it's closer. That's right. Yeah, so, I mean, it works. Do the Friday Eve thing. And uh, you'll see. Is there a specific thing you have to do on Friday Eve in order to make it that? No, nope, you just say to people, happy Friday Eve. Okay. And then you realize, wow, it's almost the weekend. And trust me, I still get emails and, and Facebook messages from people who used to watch me on TV in, in Texas. And still do it. And they say, they say, Mike, you got me started on this Friday Eve thing now, and I can't stop, and I always think of you. And it's been over a decade. And I'm not even sure they're being positive. Or, I don't know if they're being positive or negative about yeah. it. <laughs> Sometimes you can never tell with <laughs> yeah, those people who watch and listen out uh, there. That's so funny. Um, so, hey, uh, I'm Mike. That's Ray. And this is Chris. Chris Collins is back with us. Thanks, man. Hey, for, it's good to be here. Coming in. I have a little bit of a bone to pick with you guys. All right, let's hear it. Uh-oh. Uh, I have several listeners who said you guys just kind of threw me under the bus with I don't Coach know. Johnson last week. I don't week. even know what you're talking about. We didn't interview with, anybody last and week. I was out at Arizona Baseball Practice I, yesterday, I and he uh, he confirmed. I don't even know what you're so saying. So after the here. show, I want to see you guys in the alley. I don't even know what you're saying. I don't know why I don't want to go out in the alley. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean? We're going to the woodshed, fellas. What do you mean? Taking you <laughs> to the woodshed. You're like a college athlete who's in shape, and yeah. I'm like a uh, an old Middle-aged old guy yeah. who just turned 54. Come just, on. Come With on. a fantastic beard. Thank That's you. right. Thank you. It looks good. I look wiser. You are fully committed. There's no Dude, doubt. So I, much wisdom. I look wiser, but it doesn't translate on the radio because it's you know not a visual medium, so no one it doesn't can't tell. You no say tell. see you on the radio every day. I do that. I put it in quotes though. Did you notice? Air quotes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. We had another guy that's coming on the show. Uh, well, before I introduce Ian, I just want to remind people: second half of the show, Erica Barnes will be here. She is the U of A athletic director. Oh yeah. So that was pretty cool. Um, Hopefully and, some redemption for you there, Chris. Yeah. We'll see. Well, I don't know that Erica knows who I am, but we'll, we'll make introductions. I'll be <laughs> shocked if she doesn't. You know everybody, Chris. Right. At U of A especially. Now, this guy is way cool, and so I'm glad he's going to be a semi-regular on the show um, after our first interview with him. That was so fun. Our Street, uh, it's a think tank, free markets, real solutions, rstreet.org. And our new friend, Ian Adams. Welcome back to the show, sir. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Right on, man. Uh, so just to remind our listeners, last time you were on, we were talking about um, <laughs> maybe we're going to run out of organ donations because we're not going to be killing enough people on the highways because of self-driving cars. How's that for a paraphrase? <laughs> Well, we got to think about these third order effects because uh, these cars are coming sooner rather than later. <laughs> That's great. So uh, Chris and I are going to take turns asking you questions, and, and uh, we have a couple really good topics here. But I did want to start with maybe uh, can you tell us a little bit more about R Street, uh, like who you guys are, what you guys are about, um, and, you know, what's it like being part of a think tank? Oh, absolutely. Well, it's it's a lot of fun because at the end of the day, we are advocates for our ideology. We are free marketers. We characterize ourselves as libertarians. And what we want to see is people have as much flexibility as possible to make decisions because we think that people left to their own devices are able to make the best decisions for themselves. What? Right? So, I, weird. That sounds, weird. That, that sounds like oh, so old-fashioned American stuff. <laughs> so old-fashioned. Yeah, well, so we try to focus on areas where other people aren't necessarily looking because you've got a lot of really quality advocates out there who who are working on some high profile issues. And that's why we try to focus in, you know, the technical regulations in the in the kind of the stuff that most folks would find boring. We try to make it more interesting. So I'm just going to start at the 30,000 foot uh, view here. And I know we got some specific things to talk about, but uh, we have people driving in their car right now, going across town, uh, listening at home uh, or what, what may, what, wherever they might be. And what should they be most concerned about right now? What is in the hopper for you guys that, that you're just like, Hey, if you need to know one thing, 
although you don't need to know one thing, you need to know about 100 things, but what's the one thing right now that you're like, <laughs> you guys have to catch this? So I think that the biggest thing right now just because there's so much news breaking every single day. It's, yeah. it's, I mean, I'm sure it's the same for you guys. Yeah. You, you're on Twitter, you're, you're just on the news, and you're looking one way and you're looking the other. I just, I would try to pay as much attention to this administration early on as possible. Because, for instance, today the Trump administration decides that it's going to uh, walk back the sanctions against some of the Russian intelligence agencies that potentially have been implicated in some of this hacking, right? And then, on the other hand, you have the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley, going out and condemning Russia. And so it's really unlike a lot of other administrations in the past because they're not speaking with a unified voice. And so I think it's incumbent upon all of us to pay as much attention as possible and just try to figure out where this thing is going. Yeah, that's and uh, I've talked about this before on the show. And I missed it today, of course, the one the the next day that I'm going to comment about it. But the Sean Spicer uh, White House briefings, White House press briefings is now must see TV. Absolutely. I mean, it's Absolutely. it's so entertaining. <laughs> I mean, it just the entertainment value alone is amazing. <laughs> well, I think that any time, you know, a White House press briefing is able to introduce a whole new way of thinking about facts into the American lexicon. <laughs> right. <better. laughs> yes. So I mean, we all need to be we all need to be on the ball with with all of this stuff. And, and if you are a conservative, if you are a Republican, you can't just you can't just bury your head in the sand at this point and say, hey, we got a we got a guy in there that has an R behind his name. So it's all going to be good. So I understand what you're saying. L- let me let me press you a little bit on this. Part of what's refreshing for me is just a novice uh, kind of political follower is the fact that it's not a unified voice. Like for the first time, and I can't remember in my adult life, we have a bunch of people like independently thinking, even inside the Republican right. Party. And I know that's not polished politics, but man, is it refreshing. You're, you're absolutely right on that front. Uh, the fact that people aren't just going off of talking points any longer, I think is is leading us to a greater level of, uh, well, if not honesty, then then certainly uh, a greater level of candor, right? Just because people aren't taking the time to to come up with what is some massive PR strategy that they're able to roll out and and uh, and all read from the same hymnal. So no, that's that's for sure. That's good, and and I like that you've got some stronger voices coming out of Congress and the sense that the legislative branch is going to be able to start thinking about its role in taking back some of the authority that it's now ceded to the executive. Because at the end of the day, I think there's probably still some discomfort with the Trump administration because they can't quite figure out his approach. Yeah. um, But boy, is he doing a lot. (laughs) I mean, and a lot of it by executive order. So um, and maybe if we have time in the next segment, I want to get into that. We're just a minute away from the break, but uh, I do kind of want to introduce this topic and then we'll pick it up when we come back. Um, But, you know, this this RAINS Act regulations uh, from the executive in need of scrutiny act, I guess, is what it is. So like. (laughs) President, so President Trump already signed an executive order saying any new regulation, we have to kill two regulations, which is right. great. And that, so that's a directive for the executive branch, I'm guessing. Uh, but so this, congr- so the, this uh, being passed by the House is, uh, what does it do? Is it the same, same thing, but just for a different area of government? So, so similar idea. Uh, the, the executive order signed by President Trump is limited to executive agencies. Mm-hmm. There's a whole different part of the administrative structure of government called independent agencies. So when you think of the administrative state and you think of regulators, you're probably thinking of the EPA. Yeah. Well, Trump's order doesn't have anything to do with the EPA. It doesn't include an independent agency like that. So it's a little narrower in scope than I think is being generally reported. Ah. Um, and that's where the RAINS Act actually comes in and is going to be really helpful because it, it's going to have Congress take a role to review regulations. Yeah, that's great. All right, it is time for our break. So we're going to go ahead and take that. And then when we come back, we will elaborate on that. <laughs> and a couple other things, too, like uh, Tesla in the news and uh, something about Trump's phone. I don't know. Maybe we could give him a call next segment. That'd be fun. 
All right, stay with us. Ian Adams is with us. Chris Collins and crew. Mike Check with Mike Chow. We'll be right back. Thank you, Ray. Just yesterday, we were talking about. I was. I brought up all the the bands you can't go wrong with. Chicago was one. Chicago was one of them. When and you make then, a request, I fulfill those. Then here we are, right there. And I, I didn't even mention Led Zeppelin, which has been in my head all day for some reason. Down by the sea, seaside, I think it's called. By the seashore. Did you say seashore. Steely Dan? Steely Dan was on that list. Yes, you can't go wrong with Steely Dan. Nah. No. All right, let's continue our conversation. Uh, let's see. I'm Mike. That's Ray. This is Chris. And Ian Adams is with us with R Street, uh, their website, rstreet.org, a think tank. And Ian, the three of us in here are going to start a think tank as well. So we're we're excited uh, to have you on. We're looking for pointers. Yes. Oh, you got it. Well, I think you got to add CCR to your list. A little credence never hurt anyone. Ah, you can't go oh, wrong. Man. You can't yeah. go wrong with CCR. Music is a vital part to a think tank. There's no doubt about it. You got it. What I love is all of you are millennials except me. I'm the old guy here. That's and uh, and you're talking about CCR. I mean, it's like my generation had the best music and still does. Well, I was raised the right way. I mean, I, I had a dad that served in Vietnam, and he came back, and, and these were the tunes he exposed me to, man. So right I think on. you're right. Right on, man. See? Your dad had it together. And look, he, he raised a great son. Um, so, Ian, we're talking about the RAINS Act, uh, which puts a freeze on federal regulations over $100 million which it sounds like a lot of money, but I'm, these days maybe it's not. <laughs> but, uh, and, yeah. you know, also um, part of this that you really like is that it's Congress taking back some of the power that it gave to the executive branch. We, we like that. Oh, well, absolutely. At the end of the day, the, the, the people, Congress, they're the ones who, who are charged with making laws. I mean, they're the most accountable to each of us. Uh, and so you're able to call up your senator's office, your congressman's office, and really make your voice heard. So uh, the thing with regulation is it's a form of legislation. When Congress passes a law, it's a rule of general applicability. But because these laws are so complex these days, these administrative agencies, which are part of the executive branch under the president, have to expound upon what's in the law. They have to really sort of fill in the details. But the details, that's where the rubber meets the road, right? That's where, that's where all the costs are, are really born. And so Congress, having another step in this process, having another point where they can get engaged and sort of vet what the administrative agency did, is reclaiming their lawmaking power and, and sort of reasserting the balance that I think we lost a little bit during the Obama administration. Yeah, the question becomes, can they do it? Because I'm with you guys. That fires me up a little bit that Congress is putting their big boy pants back on. But the question becomes, are they willing to take on um, whatever political capital in media or in polls that, that Trump may have? You know, I Ian, maybe you can speak to this as part of that question. I was I was just perplexed at the end of Obama's administration that the guy had a, and I might get these numbers wrong, but he had a, he had a 60% approval rating, yet 60% of the country was going in the wrong direction, according to the same people. So who's <laughs> right. getting the blame? Everybody, everybody's basically saying, hey, it's Congress's fault. So all of this really does kind of work itself uh, to, to pointing to, man, we need that legislative branch to represent Ian and Mike and Chris, and they need to represent us. Absolutely. Well, and, and it was really confusing, those poll numbers at the end, as you allude to. Folks thought the country was going in the wrong direction, and they voted that way. And ultimately, we, we shifted from a Democratic to a Republican administration. Yet at the same time, it was such a toxic election process that I, I just I don't think they could help but think that things were heading the wrong way. Uh, either way, no matter who got elected in uh in 2016. So uh, it's, it's one of those things where we put so much power in the executive branch at this point. There's just so much power there. It's accrued over time. I think it's been unintentional at points, but the idea that we need to have someone that can make big decisions when it comes to managing these increasingly powerful federal agencies has been attractive. Yet at the end of the day, 
some of the decisions coming out of those agencies have been some of the most profound decisions that affect our day-to-day lives. You look at the Affordable Care Act and yeah. some of some of the way that's been enforced. Uh, that That is an expense for you. That is an expense for me. And a lot of that's happening just because a bureaucrat in Washington, D.C. decided that that's the way it has to be done. Yeah, and you kids don't even need health insurance. Look what happened. Man, <laughs> we got to repeal and replace that thing. Anyway, they're going to. So... Here's something, this kind of ties into our last visit when we were talking about uh, driverless cars. And uh, uh, I noticed that uh, Tesla was not being held responsible for that fatal crash. A guy who was uh, letting his car drive him, was he asleep, I think? <laughs> something like that. Yeah, there's, there's, some, <laughs> there's some different accounts of what was going on. Uh-huh. There was one account that, that he was watching a DVD. But the fact is, he just he wasn't paying attention in the way he needed to yeah. because these these Tesla autopilot systems, while they're very sophisticated, at the end of the day, still require driver involvement. And so he um, he got in an accident, was killed, and then uh, NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, the federal agency which regulates autonomous vehicles, they launched an investigation, and collectively the industry sort of held its breath because this was going to be something of a referendum on whether or not deployment and testing would be delayed as we worked out some of these legal legal issues in the system. And NHTSA came back, and they had a very narrow statement. Their statement was they couldn't detect any flaws in the system. Ah. So they don't look at the specifics in terms of, of uh, you know, was, was, was the system you know, the car itself broken, but the overall system that Tesla deploys, they say is not defective, which means the warnings were appropriate that te- Tesla gave, the education that Tesla gave the driver was appropriate, and, and it really kind of keeps the field open to continuing this testing, which is going to be necessary. Driverless cars for everyone. Every, yeah, it's just <laughs> martial hope. law out there. It already is. When it rains in Tucson, they're pretty much driverless cars anyway. <laughs> just every man for themselves. Uh, speak a little bit to um, how this affects um, um, policy, workforce, employment. Uh, if, if driverless technology uh, leading to uh, maybe more robotics and production with, with industries like Tesla, um, what would be one of the concerns for, uh, for you guys over there at our street as it relates to that? Well, what we're really keeping a close eye on, right, because we, we want to be coming up with real solutions to these sorts of policy issues, we're keeping a close eye on the way that autonomous vehicles are going to impact the labor force and the need for, well, uh, drivers. Uh, so commercial right. drivers represent just a huge portion of uh, the U.S. workforce, particularly out in the western states and the mountain western states. Uh, driving semi semi trucks long distances mm-hmm. uh, that's a big deal and so it was interesting when the new department of transportation secretary was being vetted by congress uh senator mike lee asked her elaine chow are you taking into account the disruption that this is going to cause to the workforce because at the end of the day, right, if these semis can drive themselves and can platoon and they're far more efficient and can, can realize all these benefits, you're going to have potentially a lot of people out of work. Yeah. So what we're thinking about at R Street is the way we're going to have to, we're going to, have to address uh, job placement, job training, potentially even rework the safety net. Uh, do we expand earned income tax credits? Do we move toward... And this is this is kind of a weird one. A universal basic income. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. Yes, I am. My son and I had some discussions about that because he was he was telling me why he w- he thought that was a good idea. In fact, I wish we had time. We uh, we could we could explore that. But maybe next time you're on, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that would be good. So we have one minute to talk about Trump's Android phone. What do you mean? It's might be already hacked. It might be already hacked. Well, he's got an old Android phone. These systems, these operating systems, are exceedingly vulnerable to hackers. All high-level government officials, their phones do not have access to the Internet. They've got systems that hook them up to a very limited number of servers and other devices. And the idea is you don't want Russia, Iran, any other country, any, any 
uh, any nefarious operator out there trying to get into the phone because these phones are equipped with cameras. They're equipped with microphones. Uh, you can you can install key logging software so that they would know what President Trump is tweeting before he actually tweets oh, it. Oh, man. Um, or what his tweet was going to be before he fixed it. Ooh, that could be even more dangerous. <laughs> right, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, uh, so yeah, yeah he's, he's got to get rid of that thing. It's bad news. That is bad news. Ian, always fun, my friend. Thanks for doing this, and uh, we'll look forward to our next visit. Have a great Friday Eve. Thanks, gentlemen. All right. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Ian. Ian Adams from rstreet.org. And, Ian, we've got some CCR for you as we head to the break. When we come back, U of A Athletic Director Erica Barnes on Mike Check with Mike Shop. <laughs> 